So today's show is a bit different as I am giving a roundup of my 10 days in New York City. I was there for Thriller Fest, the annual conference of the international thriller writers, but we also had a few days sightseeing as well as Jonathan came out for the awards ceremony. So these are some of my thoughts on the trip and a big hello to all the listeners of the podcast that I met in New York. And of course, these uh, points are all from my handwritten notes from the conference. So if there are any errors in reporting or quotes, then entirely my fault. So I've broken it down into sections and uh, I've written this out as well. So you can check in the show notes if you miss anything and all the links and everything. But um, number one, balancing ambition and contentment is a never ending task. So first of all, I did not win the award for best ebook original and it's okay, I'm not crying, it's fine. I didn't actually cry at all, so <laughs> I'm okay. James Scott Bell won and of course, uh, Jim is a great thriller writer and many of you will know him for his fantastic craft books. Jim is a hybrid author and a supportive member of the indie community, so it's pretty awesome that he won and he's been on the show three times now, I think, So, um, and the last show was on writing discipline and mindset, so just check the backlist at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcasts to have a look um, at interviews with Jim. And basically... You know, Jim is a writing teacher, so I don't feel too bad at at losing to someone who uh, has written so many books and uh, is a teacher too. So fantastic. Uh, Of course, I was disappointed, but the awards topped off a weird week for me. I spent a lot of it with chronic anxiety, which is quite unusual for me because um, I think I do push myself outside my comfort zone, but this was very outside my comfort zone um, to be there and with this sort of hanging over me because it was on the Saturday. It's the very last thing in the conference was the prize giving. So I got there on the Monday and the awards was on the Saturday. So I basically spent the whole week with chronic anxiety and all the associated bodily functions, which made things fun. Uh, But I was wondering, you know, what if I won? Should I use that as a springboard to pitch agents? Would I need to do a press release and then what if I lost should I ever enter again should I try and win other awards what did an award actually mean anyway and am I really so insecure that I need the external validation of an award and on and on and on and my brain just kind of cycled through those various things all week and it was quite unusual Uh, I've never been uh, a finalist in an award and it did mean a lot to me and I've written a blog post on this you know sort of the meaning of validation as an indie author Um, so it was very interesting to kind of go through that and when I didn't win (laughs) it was almost a relief (laughs) because I didn't have to go on stage and give a speech in front of several hundred top thriller writers Um, but of course I was also hugely disappointed because I really wanted to win and awards are validation that our writing is getting better and so I'm taking taking the nomination as a sign that I'm on the right track, um, not only with becoming a better writer, um, but also, you know, gaining the respect of my peers across the board. So these things are important. You know, we can deny that they that they are, but I think they are. Um, but usually Thriller Fest is, is always complicated for me and it sends me into a bit of a tailspin, which I'm happy to admit to you guys. And I think that many of you will probably feel like this in your careers sometimes as well. So on the one hand, it makes me dream of the lottery ticket that is traditional publishing mega success because Thriller Fest has some very big name authors with very big deals making, um, you know, a lot of money and having film deals and TV and prizes. And it, you know, I go through the usual imposter syndrome and extreme comparisonitis uh, and also an overwhelming desire to you know, get on that A-list table, which means at this point in history, getting an agent, getting a traditional publishing deal. And it's very weird for me to feel that way because of course I am a happy indie and I love what I do. And it's like there are two of me (laughs) and maybe it's, you know, where the little angel and the little devil sitting on your shoulder image comes from. But um, there's the introverted creative who wants to stay at home and write in the quiet, to live simply, to practice yoga, to walk along the canal and build a long-term career slowly by publishing the books I want to write and being in control of it all in a happy indie way. Um, That side of me 
Tommy is an artist who values the craft and is content with the satisfaction of producing a new book in the world and has readers who love those books. So, you know, that's one side of me. And then there's the other me, (laughs) who wants excitement and awards and cocktails and parties and applause and a seven-figure deal with TV and film and gaming and everything. And Thrillerfest taps into this egocentric part of me. Uh, But perhaps that's normal, um, because from everything I've read from creatives, you know, as writers, we have to balance our massive ego and our crippling self-doubt. You know, we all have self-doubt and the ego side is, you know, if you want to publish, if you want to put your books in the world, you have to have enough of an ego to think that you've written something someone else might want to read. Um, So this constant balance of ego and self-doubt is tough and I wrote about that in the successful author mindset but I'm clearly not the only one suffering from this because I went to a whole load of panels with some some of the big name thriller writers and someone asked um, a panel of like the top authors you know in the thriller niche at what point did you realize that you were a successful writer Sandra Brown romantic suspense author of 68 number one New York Times bestsellers said I don't feel as if I am ever quite there I live daily with the fear that I will never write another word Um, and I love Sandra she's she's amazing and and she said that and Heather Graham award-winning author of over 200 novels said I'm still waiting. (laughs) David Morrell, author of First Blood, which became Rambo, and David's written loads of books and has won pretty much every award going with with over 40 years as a writer, said, I'm stricken with inadequacy. (laughs) So listening to these big names, and I've heard these authors speak and say this stuff before, there are no authors on that top table who well, there doesn't seem to be, maybe they're being quiet, but um, most of them suffer from this self-doubt as well. And we all battle that. Um, And of course, is there really ever a top of the pile? Uh, We know this with Amazon charts and with with all these things, um, that even if you make it to the number one, uh, the only way from from there is down. (laughs) And in fact, a great book, um, Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert talks about this, you know, about when she wrote Eat, Pray, Love. And um, people said to her, oh, you know, how does it feel to know you'll never write a book like that again? (laughs) And she was like, well, you just have to get back to the page, don't you? You just have to write another book. Um, I also went to a panel on switching publishers and bestseller lists. And again, some very big name authors talking about how how unfair the New York Times list was and how hard they have to work and all the different things they have to do to try and make the list over and over again. (laughs) One of the authors, who shall remain nameless, talked about sending his fans out on launch day into physical bookstores throughout the country to buy his hardbacks um, in, you know, in the New York Times reporting stores so that he would get those sales. And then a few minutes later, he moaned about how self-published authors are getting reviews so soon on launch. And um, I I did turn around. I, I, there were a couple of people from Amazon there and I did turn around and kind of, you know, give a bit of a, a wink and a nod to one of the Amazon guys. because It was like, yep. I mean, it's hilarious how these same things happen at all levels of the industry. Um, what was also interesting is this panel talked about the honeymoon phase with a publisher and then the moment when the sales plateau and how moving publishers can help to get fresh eyes and fresh energy involved in their books and to keep the money coming in. And so it was so fascinating to kind of hear them talk about this. And these, these are names at the top of the industry. Um, they sounded just like indies do when we talk about money and the charts and all of that. And Lisa Gardner, uh, who I really like and writes great books, said, this stuff will drive you crazy. Find the things that make you happy in your creative life. Um, Um, you know, and stop chasing these sort of ephemeral things that just make you mad. A number of people talked about the curse of the huge advance because they are so hard to earn out and it means the next contract is tougher. A number of people also talked about how hard it is to reinvent yourself if you get pigeonholed in a genre by a publisher and that sometimes moving publishers is the only way to change it. So again, fascinating to hear about some of the moves that people make in their in their career. I also talked to a couple of authors who were doing really well in traditional publishing a few years ago, but now the money has dropped off um, uh, and things are changing. So for example, in one case, the publisher moved the publication date and so the author d- didn't get paid a chunk of money 
and that's completely out of their control. So many authors are looking at what they can do with indie in order to fill in um, you know, more reliable sources of income. But in general, the conference was very traditionally published, uh, publishing focused this year. There was one panel on hybrid self-publishing, but it, it, there've certainly been years when, when there was much more focus on indie. So that was quite interesting. So after all that angst, <laughs> I return to my own definition of success, which has always been freedom. And, you know, as I'm looking, you know, listening to all these people and thinking about what I want with my career, um, for me, it's freedom of time and to never have to work for someone else again. And I was even more aware of this when we walked up Sixth Avenue um, by the huge skyscrapers that look a bit like a server farm, if you've ever been in one of those big rooms. And I um, Jonathan and I were wondering how many of those who people who go into those tower blocks every day are actually happy um, you know certainly both of us worked in buildings like that for companies like that and are so happy not to be in that anymore um, freedom to me also means earning enough to live a good life travel when I like support my family and I also measure my life by what I create which means writing and producing and aiming to try and stay separate from the outcome of what happens after the creation is in the world so I'm actually living that life now so I am content but perhaps we all need a streak of ambition as well so there you go there is um, balancing ambition and contentment number two the ethos of the working writer so one of the reasons I love going to Thriller Fest is because there is a very generous and helpful ethos about the festival um, and about the conference. It really is all about authors teaching authors and helping new writers. It is a very author focused conference and they have craft fest, career fest, um, masterclass, um, there's an FBI day. Uh, then there are like, you know, uh, there are good parties and things um, and people are very, very helpful. And then there are sessions just for readers, but most of it is writers. So it is uh, definitely the, the best conference I've been to in terms of a thriller writing conference. Um, so yeah, ITW, International Thriller Writers, is very welcoming to new writers, however they publish. And I've only ever had encouragement from the authors I've met there. So it's, it's always a positive experience for me, even though, as I said, I'm conflicted inside. That's not because anyone's saying to me, oh, why don't you do this? Or why don't you do that? That's not how it works. That's just my, it's my internal um, balance that, that gets upset. Um, so a, an example of the, of the ethos, the giving ethos. So Lee Child was honoured as Thriller Master this year, which is an award for those with over 20 years in the industry who make a significant impact in the field. So obviously, you know, Lee Child, uh, author of the Jack Reacher series, uh, very, very successful author. He taught a full day masterclass um, with a load of new writers. He spoke multiple times at the conference, was always available um, for, to people, um, very approachable. He doesn't have to do these things, but, you know, he continues to give his time and um, tries to help others. Uh, the big name authors at the festival also launched Match Up, which is a book of short stories matching male and female thriller writers, the proceeds of which go to keep ITW free of dues to members. Um, again, those writers don't have to do it because they don't get paid, but it's giving back to the community and that really is fantastic. And I feel that this is the same ethos we have in the indie community, at least the part of the internet that I live in and you guys are part of this community. And so I hope we can all continue to share and to help other writers with our books and events and podcasts and Facebook groups and Twitter and everything. Um, you know, helping and encouraging other people is so important. Um, you know, it just is. It's, just, it's important. It's important to help others for the reason of helping, but also the intrinsic rewards that you get from helping others. So I thought that was cool. Uh, it was also interesting in terms of the working writer idea. It was interesting to note the difference between questions asked by new writers, as in those who have not published a book yet, and those who are professionals. So many of the authors there are professionals in, in, 
in terms of they write for their living, not just the people on the panel and up on the stage, but also those in the audience. So the professional writers are very clear about working hours with most citing regular times at a desk and a clear number of hours or pages per day. No working writer would countenance discussion of writer's block either. I had several writers, you know, several people asked about writer's block and every single professional writer um, said there's no such thing. Um, And as Lee Child always says, have you ever heard of trucker's block? As in, you know, if if your day job is trucking, (laughs) you get in your truck and drive. You don't say, oh, I have trucker's block today. So, you know, very much a working writer, professional writer ethos. And the discussions were all about contracts, um, marketing, money, and and very little on craft um, because writers, you know, they read. They read a lot. What was interesting with Lee Charles, he said he reads over 300 books a year. Um, You know, he reads a lot. And what I love, I think, about most authors is we're all very weird. (laughs) We all love to read books. And, um, you know, we write partly because we just like being on our own. And uh, it was was fascinating. I always, I definitely always feel like, yes, I'm one of this tribe um, when I get there. There was a session on co-writing and uh, there is a lot of co-writing going on, much more than you would expect. Of course, there's the big names, Clive Cussler, Wilbur Smith, um, following in the tradition of James Patterson now, expanding their brand offerings under big names. Um, but also a number of people writing under one name. Uh, I met quite a lot of people who were co-writing and of course indies are doing a lot of co-writing. I'm definitely doing a lot more of it myself. So I think co-writing is one of those things that either I'm noticing a lot more because I'm doing it or uh, it really is becoming something that more people are doing because essentially you can get more books out there faster and it doubles down on these big name brands. So that also was interesting because the demographic at Thriller Fest is older. I'm probably, I was probably one of the youngest people at 42. Most of the authors there are older. Now that might be to do with the fact that the conference is one of the most expensive <laughs> because, uh, you know, you it's in uh, the Grand Hyatt in um, Grand Central in New York, which is not cheap, (laughs) and the conference itself is not cheap. But it did make me wonder where the younger thriller writers are hanging out. Um, What is interesting is that when I come on a bit later to talk about uh, some of the discoverability issues, uh, having big names like Clive Cusser, Wilbur Smith, James Patterson writing with other people um, means that even when those big names pass on, um, then other writers can pick that up and the brand is the thing that goes on. So you've seen that with um, Robert Ludlam, um, with um, is it Robert Jordan, The Wheel of Time. And I mean, there's a lot of, of name brand authors who have died and other authors are writing those books. So very interesting at this point. I was also encouraged to meet a number of authors who I'd never heard of who are making significant amounts of money and are living a happy creative life. And it made me realise again that this is a huge industry with many small niches and a lot of voracious readers around the world. You don't have to be a household name to have a fantastic career with readers who love your books. So I really wanted, I was very encouraged by that. Um, You know, on the one hand, there's the people who are always on the panels who are the big names and all that and then there's all these other people like far more people the 99.9 percent of authors who don't get to be on those panels who are you know many of them doing very well so that was encouraging number three the lee child approach versus the heather graham model So I love Lee Charles Jack Reacher books and he is always an entertaining speaker. If you get to hear him speak, he's very funny. Um, But Lee did say at one of his sessions, quote, my career could not exist if I was starting today, end quote. When he was interviewed in a separate session, he explained this in more detail. His success was a classic last era career in publishing. His first print run was 18,000 copies and grew slightly bigger with each book. It took him between five and six books for him to break out, mainly through word of mouth in the independent bookstores. That ecosystem has almost disappeared now and most publishers won't invest in a new author for that long. So most publishers won't do five or six books before an author 
breaks out. Lee has 21 books, all in the same series, and writes one per year. He also said that there is, quote, no correlation between the quality of the book and success. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, end quote. So that's the Lee Child uh, approach, which I think is fascinating. And then compare this to Heather Graham, thriller master in 2016 in recognition of her incredible career. Heather has over 200 novels in multiple genres, spanning thriller, horror, romance and more. She writes cross-genre, writes multiple books per year and, it seems from the outside, um, looking at her website and um, seeing her with her family um, at the at Thriller Fest that she seems to just get on with her writing and her family life and living. She's a she's a, a great singer and um, there's just she just looks like she's having a good time really. Um, but you know clearly you can't plan a career like Lee Childs because as he said you know the 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 things just aren't in place anymore and even if they were you can't plan a career like Lee Childs but you can plan a career like Heather Graham. And it means writing what you love year after year and building an audience slowly. Now, I was thrilled to be on a panel with Heather as the chair because she demonstrates what is possible and she writes supernatural thrillers. So she's a great role model. And I did actually ask her, you know, I said, this is the only supernatural panel at Thriller Fest. Uh, you know, do you feel more at home at a fantasy conference or whatever? And she said, you know, no, Thr- Thriller is a, a broad church. And if your book is thrilling in some way, you know, you're at home here. And uh, it was really good to talk to her. So I've also been, as I've mentioned before on the show, looking at investing and um, investments and pensions and superannuation and all the exciting things like that, which uh, is is actually a lot more interesting than I had expected um, and has a lot of parallels to publishing. So um, we watched a really interesting, I think it was called Becoming Warren Buffett, um, interesting documentary the other day. And uh, he has famously said that, you know, when he dies, he wants money put in a low cost index fund for his wife. And that is his kind of pick. Uh, and indeed, if you put a monthly amount in a low cost index fund every month consistently for years, you can retire wealthy. It's boring for sure, but it's almost, um, well, it's not guaranteed, but you know, that is the advice. So um, I would recommend reading Unshakable by Tony Robbins for the details. Um, I'm not a financial advisor. This is not advice. This is just a thought. So on the one hand, you've got the putting the monthly amount in the low cost index fund. And then on the other hand, you've got the chasing that magic stock that's going to go up by hundreds of percent or betting your money on an IPO or, or trying to beat the market somehow. And it feels a bit like this lottery ticket of traditional publishing and it can drive you mad trying to get something that is outside of your control like you know picking this magic stock um you know or or buying a lottery ticket these things are not in your control whereas um if you just keep creating over time build your backlist become a better writer continue to build your readership all of this will pay off in years to come like diet and exercise, relationships, investing, slow and steady growth is effective and won't drive you crazy. So my message to myself, uh, even if you don't want to hear it, my message to me is don't keep getting sidetracked by the possibilities of success. It is not in your control. Focus on writing the next book and serving readers and you never know what might happen. This was also brought home to me when we went to the Museum of Modern Art, which of course is packed full of big name artists. <laughs> and I go every trip to visit Starry Night by Van Gogh. And it's the only painting with its own security guard and a queue of people wanting to take selfies with it, which I actually love that. Taking a selfie with a painting is awesome. Like it really shows a lot of love for that painting. and. It's, it's in this room and it's surrounded by Picasso and Matisse and like loads and loads of other famous painters you'd you'd have heard of and famous paintings that you would have heard of. And But this seems to be the one painting that inspires such adoration. And there's no way that Van Gogh would have known how the painting would impact people when he painted it. Uh, so, you know, he, he painted a lot of paintings and most of them don't have the same resonance as that painting. So this is fascinating. You don't know, you just have to create your art. So keep creating and putting your art into the world um, because you never know what people will love and it might be 
the book you haven't written yet. Um, and that's kind of how I feel. I think, I think that's what we have to keep doing. Right, number four, getting to yes, turning browsers into book buyers. So this was a really interesting session by, um, it was a sort of a statistics session presented by Book Intelligence um, Codex, where they presented a recently updated study on the reading habits of thriller and suspense readers. Uh, so this, again, this is from my notes. Um, so I might get something wrong, but this is basically, I wrote, I wrote lots of notes. There was a lot more presented, but these were the highlights that I thought. So first of all, physical retailers in decline. And, uh, you know, they said that, and it's something that you notice. I, I noticed it in New York, as well as here in the high street in Bath. Um, and what physical retail there is trends toward higher profit, higher velocity goods, which books are not. There is also an increasing fragmentation of the market. There is no longer the same volume of sales for the big names, and it's harder for mid-list authors to break through. And that echoes what I was saying before about some of the people who were doing well in traditional publishing now being worried about their money. Um, you know, if you earn a certain amount, you get used to that amount. And then if, if that changes, um, then you have to start looking to make up the shortfall. The cultural imperative around what to read has shifted and not everyone is reading the same thing anymore. Also, not everyone who reads buys. Only one in three books read are new, with 20, 29%, with 52% of books read being free through libraries, giveaways, and free eBooks. 11% are used, 4% gift, 3% subscription. And if these numbers don't add up, it's because I didn't write all the little things down. <laughs> I was scribbling super fast. But the good news is, as commitment increases, revenue increases. So turning browsers into fans is the way forward, as we all know. Discovery is broken. Even major New York Times bestsellers are not known to interested buyers. So discovery is the big challenge. Discovery sources, i.e. how readers discover a book, break down as follows. 20% discovery in physical bookstores. Now, this it was there was almost an audible gasp in the room at this because when this was presented a couple of years ago, I think it was 40%. So this is a significant reduction and it was the main finding that people were talking about afterwards. With physical retail in decline, how can books be discovered? So of course, most of you listening to this will not even have your books in physical bookstores, but hopefully this will make you understand that it's not, it's certainly not the be all and end all. So 19% author marketing is how um, books are discovered, 11% recommendations, 11% digital marketing, 10% e-promotions. Now, I personally, I don't know what the difference between digital marketing and e-promotions are. Maybe that's a price promotion like um, BookBub or something and digital marketing might be Facebook or something. They didn't really break down what went into each. And 8% e-tailor browsing. So I think that's fascinating because if you think that if only 20% of discovery is in physical bookstores now um, and the majority there fits online, so author marketing is generally online, recommendations, digital marketing, e-promotions, all of those and 8% e-tailor browsing, that's all online <laughs> basically. So that was a fascinating bit. Also, the lower the price, the lower the barrier to buy. 62% of those surveys would buy a book under $2 immediately as an impulse purchase, which is why we see things like BookBub being so um, effective. And 26% would buy a book over $16 immediately. And many of the people in the room, you know, with traditional publishers have prices uh, that are at that level. Then the conversion to buy factors. Uh, so that is what turns an interested customer into a buyer. 31% is the book message, which includes cover, title, description, category, topic, author story, and branding, uh, otherwise rounded up as it speaks to me in some way. I think we all know how that feels. Uh, it's like, oh yeah, that I want that book. And the reason is it speaks to me. <laughs> 26% uh, have heard of the author or the series, 15% recommendations and 8% special price. Um, but the interesting thing is that 63% of readers buy another book if they have 
a relationship with the author, brand or series already. So basically, if they are, if they've read your books before, 63% of them are more likely to buy the next book. So the holy grail is to convert readers to true fans and maintain an ongoing relationship with them so they buy your books again and again. Now, this is not news to indie authors. Um, we know this. And if you haven't started your email list already, then get on it. And it was so interesting that a couple of authors, you know, did say to me one of the biggest issues with um, after, you know, even if you have a hit book with a traditional publisher, you don't know who bought the book and you, because you haven't got an email list. So it's very hard, you know, uh, someone coming out of traditional publishing and going indie or going hybrid does have a, you know, doesn't have this massive list that you'd expect them to. So very interesting there. So I thought that was a fascinating roundup and with the most interesting thing being that only 20% of discovery is in physical bookstores. Fascinating stuff. Of course, if you do want to get your physical book into bookstores, the Alliance of Independent Authors has just published How to Get Your Self-Published Book Into Bookstores, which is a really good book. Um, And certainly going with Ingram Spark is always a good idea. (laughs) So um, check that out, um, How to Get Your Self-Published Book Into Bookstores by the Alliance of Independent Authors. Okay, number five, back to the bookstore. Amazon versus Barnes and Noble. So it was interesting discussing this decline in retail because I visited the Amazon bookstore inside the Columbus Circle rather upmarket shopping centre. And I also visited Barnes and Noble on Fifth Avenue in a way to kind of see what was going on with um, physical retail. So when I went to the Amazon store, it was prime day (laughs) and pretty hard to miss as six different people tried to sign me up in the shop, even though I'm already a Prime member. They were very um, hot on that. The front of the store was dominated by devices, um, Kindles, Fires and Alexa, uh, the Amazon Echo. And you could get a discount on everything as a Prime member. They had two prices, you know, this price if you're not a Prime member, this price if you are. Um, You could check prices online with a scanner and I felt it was definitely a funnel towards online and digital with clear links into the online store. The array of books was dominated by traditional publishing titles and a lot of hardbacks. But the main difference to Barnes & Noble was the emphasis on reviews. There were sections like books with more than 10,000 reviews on Amazon.com and new hardcover fiction selected using customer ratings, pre-orders, sales and popularity on Goodreads. So yes, Goodreads was mentioned in store, which was interesting. I liked... Uh, One of the sections, which was, if you like this, you'll also like this, which clearly uses the also boughts for data points. And there were printouts of customer reviews underneath most of the books displayed. I couldn't find any Amazon publishing or indie titles. So I asked and they said they had no way to find out which books were APUB or indie. Um, And I guess this isn't surprising because as we know, Amazon is not like one big company. It's lots of different little companies within a parent company. And the the people who run the bookstores aren't the same people who run Amazon Publishing or KDP, for example. Um, But I was surprised because I would at least expect to find some Amazon Publishing books given, you know, well, just why not? (laughs) Why wouldn't you? (laughs) Um, But I definitely recommend visiting one of the stores and having a look. And I did end up buying uh, a print book. You know, I wanted to just go through the whole experience and I bought Long Story Short, The Only Storytelling Guide You'll Ever Need by Margot Lightman. And um, that sort of caught my eye and the reviews were there. And yeah, it was, it went, and the buying experience was fine. And as an international customer, I was like, yes, I am a Prime member, but in the UK. And so I just showed them um, my Amazon UK thing and they were like, great, you're a Prime member. And then I got some money off. So that's cool. And then the Barnes and Noble on Fifth Avenue, which I would have expected to be a premium site and a premium experience given Fifth Avenue is like shopping central. But actually it was pretty, it was pretty shabby. Like it, I don't know if Americans use the word shabby, um, but it's, you know, sort of not premium. <laughs> <laughs> the books weren't laid out that well. There were a lot more, um, th- those, the paperback versions, are they mass market paperback? That's the one where they're uh, not so nice. Um, so, I mean, if you're going to do a physical store, the physical good needs to be nice, which I guess is why the, the Amazon store had a lot more hardbacks and a lot nicer presentation. Um, 
it were there was a lot of non-book stock in Barnes and Noble, um, but not devices. So it's actually hard to even find uh, a Nook device. So Barnes and Noble had, of course, the cafe. They had a lot of like, you know gift stuff um, but it was hard to find a nook device i eventually found them by um at the back towards the magazines <laughs> which is an odd place for them it was also hard to buy a book so we, we actually were going to buy a book we took one off the shelf and we approached two different desks two different staff who neither who both refused to take payment and directed us to a cashier so um and then the queue was too long so in the end we we put the book back and bought it online <laughs> which is terrible but I did think of the Apple store so if you go into an Apple store every single person who can serve you has a mobile payment device now that's clearly not that hard so a little tip to Barnes and Noble like make it easy for a customer to buy have a mobile payment device with every you know every person or at least someone standing behind a desk I mean th there were literally two people standing behind two different desks who we couldn't pay um, so it was very interesting comparing these two bookstores so um, yeah you know I am a fan of print I am a fan of bookstores I love bookstores I go into several of the bookstores in Bath all the time and I do buy pr a lot more print now because you know we're staying still <laughs> we're kind of settling um but it's yeah it's really interesting that the layout of the store makes a big difference so there you go that's my experience with uh the bookstores and then finally just some miscellaneous uh bits and bobs that i wanted to share um so and you know on craft and other things so uh just miscellaneous things David Morell uh, said, for First Blood, I set out to write an action book that didn't feel like a genre book. And he did a really good session on, you know, how to write a genre book, but make it much better. Um, so we don't, we can write genre, but we can also write genre that, you know, books that stand out in the genre. Uh, he talked about using at least two other senses other than visual to bring depth to your writing. Um, and, you know, kind of said that with the the development of TV and film, people often use visual to the, uh, you know, over everything else, but you should think of two other senses. Also, when you think the book is done, change the font, print it out and edit again. And all authors have ticks, figure out what they are and fix them in the second draft. We, we do definitely have ticks and they can be different ticks per book, I think. So yeah, and a tick here means something you do over and over again. Um, yeah. Val McDermott, who is one of, you know, very big British crime writer, talked about writing her radio play um, Resistance, which is about a sort of apocalyptic plague. Um, what was interesting about that is, she, is I've never even considered writing a radio play, but she said they can be a great form of writing um, and also successful. Actors like doing them because they don't have to learn the lines so they can fit them in between projects so you can get some big names for a radio play. It's also all about the words so the writer has more control than a screenplay. So I thought that was fascinating and I'm going to be interviewing someone about radio plays later this year, so that's cool. Uh, back on Lee Child, he did loads of sessions because he was Thriller Master this year. So that's why there's so much Lee Child. <laughs> uh, he said, a great thriller needs two things. Unfortunately, nobody knows what they are. <laughs> great quote. Uh, but then he did go on to say that um, his best tip is to open loops um, and engage human curiosity. So ask a question and then don't answer it in order to keep the suspense going. So set up a question, don't answer it until the end, like set up a really big question and don't answer it till the end, then add in multiple shorter arcs with smaller questions. Now, Lee used to work in TV and said that after the remote control was invented, they would add trivia questions before the ad break and that so people would stick around to get the answer when the show restarted so that, you, you know, people wouldn't turn over. So this creates a narrative engine that drives the reader through the book. So they have to know what happens and why. I think this is actually a really good tip, whatever your genre, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what your genre is, open loops. And in fact, it works in nonfiction as well. So open loops and, um, and then open lots of smaller loops within that. 
Other random quotes from Lee. Um, On book marketing, be a nice person, never talk about the book, make them like you and they are more likely to buy. And of course, this is something we all know, um, the principle of know, like and trust means people are more likely to buy your book. He also commented about, um, you know, readers, Um, you know, readers are not like you. Readers are not writers in general and most people are not habitual readers so when you read as a writer it's a very different experience to how other readers read um of course that doesn't mean we can learn anything from that it's just you know when he said it i was like okay that's that's really interesting we have to remember that we are often not our market He also said that as a writer, you have to hold contradictions in your mind at the same time. You have to think that writing is an art form, a craft. You know, you have to consider the muse and there's almost a spiritual side to being a writer. But then on the other hand, the contradiction there is writing is a job. It's commercial. I have to make money with it. It pays the bills. So you have to kind of keep these contradictions in your mind and be able to respect both those parts. A number of people talked about choosing a publisher and said, go where the love is. Um, You know, talked about turning down bigger money to go somewhere where they were treated well and how much that is important, both in editorial treatment and also just in general. So that was fascinating. And finally, um, you know, everyone always asks Lee Child about the Jack Reacher movie and he said a book is the ultimate product everything else is secondary a book is not a chrysalis or a pupa waiting to be something else like a film or tv show and I think that's a really good place to end because so often we do you know and I started out talking about yeah I'd love a tv deal I'd love a film deal gaming deal whatever but the book is the book itself is perfect the book is the ultimate product and that's what we create. So we don't have to constantly want something else. We are creating the ultimate product. And what I love, I guess, is that that Thriller Fest, I I get all these different things um, from from the conference. And of course it was a challenging few days for me and yeah, but it is as ever a regular highlight in my writing career. I went in 2012, 2014, 2015, and of course now 2017. And you can find um, this in the show notes I've linked to those previous years um, with a whole load more craft tips um, in previous years. I think what's interesting is as my own career has changed, in 2012, I'd only written um, two novels. So um, 20 yeah I'd written two novels when I went in 2012 so I was really learning a lot about craft same in 2014 I still feel we can learn more craft but I feel like we learn it by writing later on you know when you start going to these conferences a lot of the notes you're writing are because you haven't done it yet and then later on you're looking for different things so yeah at Thriller Fest I meet amazing authors I'm inspired I always learn new things and I highly recommend joining International Thriller Writers ITW if you write thrillers Um, and the conference is fantastic and in 2018 next year George R.R. Martin um, of Game Game of Thrones fame will be Thriller Master so it will likely be a bumper year in terms of attendance Um, perhaps I will see you there I'm not sure if I'm going yet I normally go every two years um, but we will see Um, perhaps I might see you there or um, yeah but I will definitely be going again and I definitely recommend conferences like this to uh, learn and meet people and be inspired.